Hi, ICA. It's good to be seeing you here. Last year, during the tree series, I bought a small pot of sweet olive trees. The shop told me that sweet olive is a strong plant and easy to manage, and as long as I water it, the flowers will bloom. I was excited, I bought it back home, but I waited for a long time, nothing happened. And because I didn't see any difference, I actually started to question if there will ever be flowers. But then there's a voice at the back in my mind, as long as you water it on a walkly basis, the plant is absorbing the nutrition and the root is being strengthened beneath the surface. Fundamental elements are coming together which you cannot see with your physical sight. I was overjoyed when the flowers eventually appeared last month. Here are the principles I learned in the process. Things that we see with our eyes don't always mean real. It could be an illusion like magic. On the other hand, things that we can't see don't always mean non-exist, like the oxygen around us. In fact, I realize that things that are not visible are oftentimes more important than the visible things, like love in every human relationship. And the same is true for the spiritual reality. We will continue the sermon series, Born Ready, as we go through the Gospel according to Mark. The sermon title today is Eyes to See. Friends, if you are struggling to see God and His mighty work in this season, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes and you will see clearly that Jesus is in the midst of all the circumstances you are facing. If this is what you want, I would like to invite you to say a big Amen wherever you are. Among all the gospel, Mark often shows us the spiritual blindness of the disciples of Jesus. They always failed to understand what Jesus was trying to say and do. The disciples were often fixated on the physical matters and blinded to the spiritual reality. And here's the story we'll begin with in Mark chapter 6. When he, Jesus, went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he, Jesus, began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Now send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. The narrative of Mark is interesting here. The disciples of Jesus were teaching their teacher what to do. At your first glance, you might be thinking the disciples were being kind. But there are two strong reasons I suggest that they were just getting impatient and grumpy here. Number one, Jesus has so much compassion for the people that he would never overlook their physical needs. And number two, the need for food actually didn't come from the people. They didn't mind staying and listening to Jesus. And Jesus answered the disciple, You give them something to eat. And the disciple said to Jesus, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. Say with me, Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus commanded them all to sit down in groups. And you know the rest of the story. Those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men that day. When Jesus said to the disciples, Go and see, I suggest that the disciples saw two things. The first is the five loaves and the two fish in their hands. That signifies their limitation, scarcity, or their shortcomings. And number two is, as they look up, it was the crowd of the 5,000 men that signifies the enormous task they are asked to do. The disciples saw an impossibility, so people needed to be sent away. But Jesus saw an opportunity to feed the people. There is a huge gap in between the reality in the eyes of the disciples and the spiritual reality in the eyes of Jesus. The first principle I would like to draw from the passage is that if we want to see the spiritual reality, we must see through the eyes of faith. Because the Bible says, faith is confidence 
in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who seek Him. Faith shifts our focus from us to God, from our problem to His power. And notice this, Jesus could have done it all by Himself, but He says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. Because Jesus wants the disciples to partner with Him and learn the most important lesson called faith. There is a type of miracle that will never happen until we do it by faith. Because faith is the kind of lesson that can never be taught until we exercise it. Faith is only a theory until we are tested. Religion is what you are able to do for God, but the gospel is what God enables you to do. If we focus on our resources, it will never be enough. And if we focus on our strength, we will surely be crushed at some points. There is something I call good insufficiency that can only be filled by the sufficiency of Christ. I call it good because it is like the thorn cap in the flesh to always remind us to humble ourselves and point us to the glorious power of God. And that's why Jesus says to Apostle Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in witness. And Paul says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my witnesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Friends, today when you look at yourself, perhaps all you see is a mess and failure, and you might be thinking, I don't have enough talents, I don't have enough resources. But let me encourage you with this. Jesus is saying to you today, go and see. This little something may not be enough for you, but I am the Lord God Almighty. Is there anything too hard for me? You just need to see it through the eyes of faith. Let's continue the story. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd of 5,000 men. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. And later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him, Jesus, walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They, the disciples, cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he, Jesus, spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then Jesus climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. The disciples were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Notice in the last verse how Mark connects this story with the feeding of the 5,000. And let me paraphrase what Mark is trying to say here. The disciples shouldn't be amazed by Jesus walking on water if they have understood about the feeding of the 5,000. By this time, the disciples should have known that Jesus is the Messiah, but they just didn't see it because their hearts were hardened. The second principle I would like to draw from the passage is that if we want to see the spiritual reality, we must have a heart of flesh. Let me elaborate as we fast forward to the next passage in chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Jesus asked them, like the very first time, How many loaves do you have? And the disciples replied, Seven. The disciples responded as if nothing had happened before. 
once again Jesus directed the crowd to sit down. And that day, you know rest of the story, and other 4,000 men were fed and seven food baskets of broken pieces left over. And right after this incident, the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And Jesus left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Jesus has healed the sick, cast out demons, and multiplied the bread to feed thousands of people. Yet the Pharisee still wanted to seek another sign from Jesus. They actually got the privilege to witness Jesus' resurrection, yet they refused to believe in Him. Here is the lesson for us. Miraculous signs help us to see the spiritual reality only when our heart is right. When our hearts are hardened, we may see many signs and wonders, yet don't see God in the picture. The disciples couldn't see because their eyes were only fixated on themselves, on the physical matters. The Pharisees couldn't see because their intention was wrong. The scriptures told us they only wanted to test Jesus. So, what are the causes of a hardened heart? The number one reason is unrepentant sins. Pride, unwillingness to let go, anger, bitterness, jealousy, lust, covetousness, disappointment, worries of life, love of money. They are like tumors in the heart. Friends, what is the condition of your heart today? Has it been hardened for a long time? Has it become calloused so you can't see the spiritual reality in this season of your life? Are you too exhausted? Are you worried and upset about many things but miss the only one thing that is necessary? But I want to tell you this. The good news is the heart of Jesus will never be hardened. Our heart may be hardened. But it is against the nature of God for His heart to be hardened. The heart of God is always ready to forgive, renew and embrace you. You will be transformed and renew as soon as you cry out to Him and run back to Him. God says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from you and give you a heart of flesh. If you want to see the spiritual reality, we must see with a heart of flesh. And let me close with this last point as we finish the story. Jesus left the Pharisees, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. And now the disciples have forgotten to bring bread, and they have only one loaf with them in the boat. Do you notice the contradictions between no bread, they've forgotten to bring bread, and they had one loaf in the boat? Apparently, this is a literary device. Mark is trying to poke fun at the disciples. The disciples do not understand the feeding of the 5,000s and the feeding of the 4,000s because they do not know Jesus, who is the one loaf, the bread of life. The reader sees it, Mark sees it, but the disciples couldn't seize it. The first principles I would like to draw from the passage is that if we want to see the spiritual reality, we must have the right image of God. As Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? What is the people's image of God? And the disciples told Jesus, well, John the Baptist, and others says Elijah, and others says one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked them, the disciples, one more time, But who do you say that I am? But what about you? I don't care what other people will say of me, but what is your image of God? And at that time, people answer him, You are the Christ. And Jesus charged them to tell no one about him. There are 16 chapters in Mark. 
And we are in chapter 8, the core of the entire gospel, centered with this question asked by Jesus, Who do you say that I am? I believe that this is an essential question that every disciple of Jesus must answer. It is said that so many people believe in Jesus with the wrong image. What is the image of God you have in your mind? Is he ugly or beautiful? Is he cruel or kind? Is he worthy or unworthy? Does he ever fail you or he is a faithful God who never failed his promises? Who do you say Jesus is? Because your ability to see God and his spiritual reality all depends on what you answer to this question and how convinced you are of the answers. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asked. The Bible says that there is only one way to see God, and it is too by looking at Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. And Hebrew 1 3 says, The Son is the radiant of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Is Jesus just a good man to you? A healer? Is he just a moral teacher? Is he just a friend of you? Or is he just a source of prosperity? But I want to tell you this Jesus is more than any of this. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the King from heaven. But he chose to be lowly in this world and suffer for our sins so that we are no longer orphans but a child of God. We are no longer sinners, but a saint. That is the picture of the servant king described in the Gospel of Mark. That's the spiritual reality we have to see today. The disciples described by Mark were probably the most unqualified people to be followers of Jesus. They didn't know the scripture much. They misunderstood Jesus and never comprehend his parables. They argue who is the greatest all the time. Some of them doubted Jesus and even betrayed him. But you know what? They made one critical decision that is different from the Pharisees and the non-believers. And that is to stay with Jesus in the same boat no matter what. Friends, today it might be a stormy season for you. But I want to tell you that you are going to be alright. As long as you have the one loaf in the boat and his name is Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is going to provide. He is going to protect you. He is going to calm the raging seas around you. If today you want to see God in the midst of what you are facing right now, I want to encourage you to take the step of faith to invite Jesus to your life and areas where you are struggling. The Bible says, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will guide you into all the truth. If there are unrepentant sins that are hardening your heart, confess to Him right now and let the Holy Spirit renew you. Remember this, the heart of our Heavenly Father can never be hardened. He longs for you to come back to His embrace. And if you have been waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled in your life, or maybe your life is just like the plants I mentioned in the beginning. There might not be visible progress, and it makes you feel stuck and stagnant in this season. The Bible says, God neither slumber nor sleep. God is at work all the time, and there are fundamental elements coming together beneath the surface that are not visible to you just yet. You just need to continue to believe. Remember, the flowers will bloom and the glory will come as long as you are rooted in the person of Jesus. God is always good and faithful and all His good promises will come to pass. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You for Jesus. We thank You that You have sent Him to die on the cross for our sins and so that the Holy Spirit will come and in fact, you, you said that as we believe, the Holy Spirit lives in us and He will guide us into all the truth. And Father, I pray that today you will renew our heart and so that we will see clearly that God, you are at work. You are in the same boat with us. 
and we don't have to worry about all these things in our life. We cast all our anxieties upon you because you care for us. And Father, I pray for all those who are praying with me. I pray that you will let them to see Jesus in the picture. You will let them to see Jesus in the circumstance that Jesus, you are walking with them so they don't need to fear. And Father, I would like to also pray for those who want to invite Jesus in their life for the first time. And Father, I pray that they will see the spiritual reality. They will see God, they will encounter you face to face. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower all of us to overcome all the struggles that we are facing, all the challenges. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.